Testing, one, two, three. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Just thought I'd wait a minute or so just to make sure that uh, everyone was, uh, was uh, here and uh, joining us. And so we're glad you've joined us this morning for our, our service. Thank you to Gabby for uh, leading our worship. Uh, throughout the service this morning. We appreciate those songs and uh, you're taking the time to, to, uh, to, to lead us into the presence of the Lord. Uh, um, I have a few announcements I would like to make this morning uh, before I share with you something that's on my heart. Um, firstly, I'd like to just take a moment to express my deep appreciation and thanks to all those that made our Christmas Eve virtual service go over so well. It was so, so tremendous. I, I just felt so blessed and so encouraged with it. You know, uh, over the last few months, I've been wondering about the Christmas Eve service, wondering how it was going to go. And so just to see how it all came together in the fashion we did, it was such a tremendous blessing to so many of us. And so we were able to join with the other churches in our community and a dear lady from Alert Bay, Pee Wee, and it was just phenomenal. I would like to give a special thanks out to, uh, to those that uh, were in our church. Uh, so proud of you and so thankful for the energy and time you put into it. Uh, Gabby, uh, who uh, did the welcome and also shared a song, Silent Night. Russ and Jen, who did a tremendous job with the scripture reading and also giving a little explanation and uh, and thoughts to go with it. Uh, Brent Dustin who uh, sang a, a, a beautiful song. I just really enjoyed that song. Brent, you did a really great job with that. Thanks for that. You have a real gift, brother, in that area and so thank you for that. Um, Michael Wickstrom who did all the editing, the the, uh, the, the published it, promoted it. I don't, he didn't promote it, but I mean published it. He he, whatever the word I'm looking for, the, the, the production side of it, uh, editing it, putting it all together, just phenomenal job, Michael. Thank you so, so much for that. And Donovan, who, who was behind the scenes there, getting the, uh, you know, the endings and the beginning slides and uh, uh, helping us to upload the files from various videos. Just so many people involved. And so those are the people that were involved from our church. Thank you so much again for that and I've had such tremendous comments back from the community and from our circle of people that are connected with our church and and town and so thank you for that even this morning one of the other churches I had a, uh, a dear lady contact me and said how much they enjoyed it and, and other people as well so bless you thank you so much it was a home run so thank you so much and also just to see our churches coming together was such a blessing and perhaps a uh, something new starting and refreshed in, in, in our lives as a community and, and in our churches. Um, one, other, one or two other things I'd like to mention quickly before I get into my message, uh, that is in January, starting a new series. Looking forward to it, so when we get into the new year, I would encourage you to join with us. Uh, we're going to do the gospel in 90 days, and so that's going to include every Sunday sermon talking about uh, the life of Jesus, the teaching is of Je teachings of Jesus, the example of Jesus Christ as we follow through the Gospels together every Sunday for three months. And so if you add up all the chapters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's uh, 89 chapters, I believe, in the Gospels. And so we are going to look at reading a chapter a day as a whole congregation and as your pastor, I would really encourage you, please join with me. Uh, make this your devotional experience along with us and, uh, and join us every day in reading the Gospels. And so we'll start with Matthew 1 and we'll just work through Matthew 2 the next day and Matthew 3 the day after that. I'll, I'll share that reading plan as, uh, as time goes on, but we'll probably get going close to the middle of January and, uh, and then I'm also hoping that we can have life groups, virtual life groups, that people can check in with a group of maybe five or six people uh, and, 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 uh, and just share their observations from the week before. I think that'll be phenomenal. So that's what's happening. So speak to me if you'd like to be in a group. Uh, poke one of our elders 
uh, and ask them if they're doing a group or what that looks like as well. That would be good. <laughs> but you don't have to be an elder, uh, you know, to lead a group. And so if you'd like to lead a group or coordinate a group, uh, it would be phenomenal. Talk to me, talk to one of our elders, and we'd be glad to encourage you with that as well, all right? So it's going to be awesome. Lastly, one more announcement I'd like to give before we look into the message, and I'm very excited to share this as well. Uh, John and Hannah Rukin asked me to make a, a special announcement today, which is my honor to do that. They were blessed on Saturday morning around 11.30 a.m. with a baby girl. And uh, the little girl's name is Leah Rose. Leah Rose. And so that was Christmas Day. We had a rose on Christmas Day. Praise the Lord. Leah Rose. So what a tremendous blessing to them and to us. Baby's doing well. Hannah's doing good. The whole family. And so we're absolutely delighted and thrilled with this new life born on Christmas morning. All right. So that's great. So anyway, so those are the things I wanted to share with you today. So we're, let's look into God's Word together this morning. And so let's pray as we begin. Father, we come to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in the Word of the Lord. We ask, Lord Jesus, that as we do it, that it will bring life again, as your Word does. Bring life into us, no matter where we're sitting, wherever we're at. Uh, Lord, I pray even for me that you'll help me in faith to just to recognize and to be able to see the people that are watching, and to visualize them. And uh, that people's lives will be touched and be encouraged no matter where they're sitting, in their living rooms, in their kitchens, uh, in their family rooms, uh, wherever they're at, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will reach them, touch them, and that you, Lord Jesus, will make your word alive and real to each and every one. Anoint these lips now of clay and this life and this vessel that I am bring forth your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to speak to you today about uh, declarations of faith. Faith declarations, that's my message today. So it's more of a teaching today, and I felt that I would bring that today on December the 27th as we move on from Christmas, that's the end of the year, and as we finish a year and as we move into a new year. On my heart today is the fact that I feel it's so significant and important that you understand and that I understand and that we practice declaring faith, faith declarations. That is a form of prayer. And I would like to speak to you about that today. Uh, we have the ability to, to make faith declarations as God's people. And that is such a wonderful blessing that we have. Uh, I'd like to talk about that, uh, how to, the ability to make faith declarations. I would like to, to share with you why sometimes when you do a faith declaration, how come sometimes it works and, so, and other times it does not work. I'd like to speak to you about uh, why, why does sometimes that it feels right when you're making a faith declaration, and other times it feels kind of off or kind of, kind of hollow. I'd like to address that today. Today, therefore, I will explain what declarations are, uh, that it is a form of prayer, and that it can become powerful in your life. It can become a very powerful form of prayer in your life, in your toolbox, in your, in, in your communication, in your interaction, in living your life with the Lord, uh, and in this world in which we live, and that it can be something that is, is very natural, become very natural out of the flow and the integrity of your life. And so I want to talk about that today. So what is a faith de declaration? How does that work, and how can it be effective in my life? to release the kingdom of God, to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to be glorified. Well, that's what we're talking about. So listen, first, I'll just let me grab a drink of water so that I'm not too much of a dry preacher. And we'll get into it. So let's define what a, what a faith declaration is first. Let's, let's look at that. A faith de declaration is hearing God's Word, and then speaking the words that He gives you in faith. Let me share that again. What's a faith declaration? A faith declaration in the Bible is hearing God's Word and hearing God's words and speaking those words in faith. That's a faith declaration. 
To put it another way, a faith declaration is, it is a sense that you have within the spirit, within your spirit, and verbally agreeing with it. Did you get that? A faith de- declaration is a sense within your spirit that you're, you're sensing and you're your believing should come to pass or that is right for us right now in this moment. And, you, and you, you sense it within your spirit and you verbally say that. You verbally agree with that. You, you agree with it in your heart, but you verbally agree with it as well. That's a faith declaration as naturally as it is. That's what it is. So let me unfold that today and talk to you. And the best place I think we could go to start this and to discuss what this means, to explain what this is, is to simply look at the life of Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, we're going to spend 90 days looking at the life of Jesus Christ as we come to the new year. But as we, therefore, as kind of a beginning to that, here we are in the life of Jesus Christ today. Well, Jesus used faith declarations. Maybe he didn't use that particular phrase, but that's what he did. Uh, let's look at his example today. Firstly, let's go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. And in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, we find the story of a fig tree. And in this fig tree story that is before us, we find that Jesus Christ comes along one day. We're going we're gonna to read. So if you have your Bible or your, your device, please go to Mark, chapter 11. And we're going to read verse 23 and 24 in a few moments. But first, let me just give you a little background. So Jesus is going along, and they're heading towards Jerusalem. And he sees a fig tree. And the fig tree is in leaf. And so he approaches it, believing that since it's in leaf, that it would have figs. And he goes up to it, and it has no figs. Now, that wasn't natural. When a fig tree came in the leaf, it should have figs in it as well. And so being an abnormal tree... Jesus just spoke to the tree, and he said, may no one ever eat fruit of you again. And so basically, he cursed the tree. Then he walked away. And uh, the next day, they came by again, and as they did, the disciples were amazed. They said, look at Lord, look at Jesus. He said, Master, look at the fig tree that you cursed has died. They, they saw the leaves had shrivel, shriveled up and that the tree had actually died. They were just overwhelmed. They remembered what Jesus had said. Well, Jesus had spoke to that tree, and he had said to it, may you never produce fruit again at that moment. What did he do? It was a declaration that he made that caused that tree to wither. And so with that in mind, we read in Mark chapter 11, In the 20th verse, it says, In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots, right? And so he said, Rabbi, look, it happened just like you said. Jesus goes on to say in the 23rd verse of Mark chapter 11, these words, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done him therefore I tell you whatever you ask for in prayer believe that you receive it and it will be yours Wow that's an amazing statement notice what Jesus said in the 14th verse previous to this as I was saying as he went by the tree the day before Jesus said may no one ever eat fruit from you again that's what he said The next day, the tree was withered up, and Jesus says again in this verse and in this area, whoever shall say, I said to that fig tree, and look what happened to that fig tree. He's saying to them now, whoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, cast in the sea, it'll happen. What's he saying? Whoever speaks those words, that will take place whoever shall say now there's more than this one example of jesus using declarations speaking them out in faith using his words take another story for example and it's in matthew chapter 17 in matthew chapter 17 we find a different story but we find the same outcome and we find again jesus making a declaration 
Matthew 17, of course, records the story of Jesus Christ going up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And after he was transfigured with his inner three disciples, uh, he comes back down the mountain. And as he does with his disciples and sees the other disciples having a discussion with a family, and as he approaches them, uh, the father comes and, and falls before the Lord and begins to speak to Jesus and say to him, you know, that, that, his, that his little boy has been having these terrible seizures and it's gone on for a long time. And he says, it's, it's really quite scary. Uh, it's it's life-threatening. It's uh, something we're very, very concerned for, for, for the welfare of his life, not just for his good health, but even, you know, he puts himself into positions where his life is in danger. For example, he'll have a seizure sometimes and fall right into a fire. You know, we could be having a fire, a bomb fire or whatever, and he, can, he, he would fall right into the fire. If we're close to the water, he's close by the water. If he's not being supervised, he could have a seizure and fall right into the water. And so they were very, very concerned about this. And so Jesus spoke and, 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 and dealt with the situation. It says in Matthew chapter 17, and in the 20th verse, these specific words from the Lord. Listen to this. Because, because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now think about that verse, Matthew 17, 20. Again, what Jesus had said was Jesus rebuked the spirit and he brought healing to this little boy. And it amazingly happened. He made a declaration at that moment. The disciples go up to Jesus and they say, why couldn't we do that, Lord? We've been praying for him. And it didn't work. He says, well, you need to have faith and you need to make that declaration. And that's why it worked for me, he said. He said, again, you can say to this mountain. And that moment, the mountain was a little boy who had seizures. That was the mountain. It wasn't a physical mountain, but it was a mountain in that life, in the lives of that family and that little boy. And Jesus spoke to that mountain in faith. And what happened? The little boy was healed at that time. So again, we find another example of Jesus dealing with that. In this, in this case, it was an evil spirit, a demon, and he, and he just cast it out and it had to leave. Jesus noted to the disciples, that it's more than his words, however, in this situation. He said to them, faith is needed. Why couldn't we do it? He says, because of your faith. This kind cometh out by prayer, but he also noted faith is needed. In fact, if you go back to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, that we read a little earlier, in the 22nd verse, it said in Mark, chapter 11, in the story of the fig tree I just read, before the verse before the reading I gave, it said this, have faith in God. And so again, Jesus is saying, you can say things, and when you say them in faith, the mountain will be moved. That could be dealing with a fig tree, in this case, something in the natural realm. It could be dealing with a little boy that has seizures, it could be some other kind of issue to do with healing or life. And you can speak words, and if you'll speak those words in faith, it'll happen. Now that's profound. Jesus did that on a number of occasions, but he also said then to his disciples and to therefore to you and me, you can do this. You can do this. Follow my example, my lead. You can say to the mountain in your life, move, using whatever words are appropriate at that moment. So that's what we're talking about today. But we have used the, the wording, the, we have framed that within the meaning of faith declarations to describe what Jesus Christ did, right? Let's look at another story. It's the story of Lazarus. Now, if you have your Bible again, please turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, remember the story of Lazarus? He's raised from the dead. Well, 
Lazarus had got really, really ill, deathly ill. And so word got to Jesus, he's with his disciples, that his friend Lazarus was gravely ill. This death was extremely severe and life-threatening. And so Jesus got the word, it says in Luke chapter, or not Luke, John chapter 11, verse 6. It says, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he sta stayed where he was two more days. Now, it took a day for the person to bring the message to walk to where Jesus was. Jesus waited two days, and Jesus knew it was going to take another day to get to Lazarus, which makes four days. But isn't it interesting? He delayed for two days before he went. He delayed until after Lazarus was dead before he went back. He was led by the Holy Spirit to wait. Isn't that interesting? This is a very important part of the story. He was led by the Holy Spirit to wait. He did not respond immediately. He was led to wait. And then he moved. In verse 38, as we move through the story, just very, very briefly, in 38, Jesus walks back to where Lazarus is now with his disciples. And he comes, and he senses, and he sees, and he observes, and experiences the emotion and the pain of the family and friends of what happened to Lazarus, that he had died, that he had been put in the tomb. Isn't it interesting that it says in John chapter 11 and verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Notice Jesus, say, it says, once more deeply moved. I find that absolutely phenomenal and interesting. Jesus was deeply moved. Now, Sometimes we've talked about this, talking about his tremendous empathy. And yes, that's a big piece of it. He was very empathetic, very compassionate. His love went out to the family, uh, to the pain. Even his own personal pain is involved in that because he loved Lazarus so much. But I believe there's something else going on here. Jesus Christ was moved and there was something else going on. There was intercession going on. There was intercession, intercessory. There was deep prayer, I believe. He was moved in his spirit, and he interceded at a deep level again for Lazarus. There was this deep prayer and this deep inter interaction taking place between him and the Father. I believe that's what was taking place as well. So we find as we move towards something that takes place, which is Jesus' declaration. First, we find him being moved by the Spirit to wait two days. Then we find him in the process also unpacking that in his spirit, praying to the Lord about it, interceding. And now Jesus speaks. Oh, I'll close my Bible. I've got to open it up again. John, four, John chapter 11, here we are. Verse 41. I'm going to read verse 41 to 43. Uh, encourage you to follow along. Encourage you to read it in your own Bibles or devices. Encourage you to write some notes that you can read. Recount some of this later on. John chapter eleven forty one. Now listen, it says, So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He made a declaration. But isn't it interesting? First, Jesus brings a preamble for those that are listening. He speaks to the Father loudly. He wanted to bring context. He wanted to frame what he was about to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, sometimes in a declaration, it's helpful to frame it for the people that are there. Uh, and that's what Jesus did. You know, same with prophecy. Sometimes the Lord has laid upon you a prophetic word. It, it is often a good idea to frame it, to, 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 to introduce it. And that's what Jesus did. He said, so he said, Father, I know you hear me, but for the sake of those that are around me, I'm just speaking to you now. And then he didn't have to do that, but he did that to bring them along and give a witness to the Father, right? Very important, significant thought in our lives and principle of life. But the point is 
that Jesus was led by the Spirit. Jesus had been in intercession as well. And at the right moment then, when he came to the tomb of Lazarus, then he makes this declaration. His declaration is, Lazarus, come forth. Isn't that something? Jesus revealed that his words brought life. Jesus modeled to you and I that we can speak his word, the words of the Spirit of God, the words from the heart of the Father. We are to speak those out. We agree with heaven and we speak those words out and they bring life. Whoever shall say to this mountain, and at that moment, the mountain, the mountain was a man who was dead in the tomb. That was the mountain on that day. And Jesus spoke to the mountain, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forward. He came back to life. That is a powerful, powerful story. But listen, here, I've given you three examples of how Jesus Christ made declarations of faith. But I also have given you examples where Jesus had said on two of those three times when Jesus said, and that's not to exclude this one, but I'm just saying in all these different things, Jesus would often say to his disciples, he would say down through the ages to you and I, he says, you can do this. You can do this too. Follow my example. I'm there with you. And, and you are my hands. You are my feet. You are my mouth. Sometimes we talk about being the hands of the Lord. Sometimes we talk about being the feet of the Lord. Sometimes we talk about being the smile of the Lord. But sometimes we also, listen, listen, we are to be the words of the Lord. And that's a faith declaration, guys. There is such power in our words. Can you see that? That even in a natural plane, if we even talk about outside of prayer, your words are profound. But you add that to faith, and you add that to being led by the Spirit, and you have got something overwhelmingly powerful. It is the wow factor. The wow factor. Turn with me to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 10, verse 8. Romans 10, and in the 8th verse. And in Romans we find the Apostle Paul speaking. And Paul said this, under the inspiration of the Spirit. Here's what Paul said, Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 10. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Did you hear that? The word is in your mouth. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yes, you will. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, made right with God. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So the very principle is pointed out in our salvation experience that it is believing in our heart and then expressing that belief with our mouth, making that declaration of faith, right? That's what that is. That's how it works. That's how we come to know Jesus Christ. And so I will literally do this with someone if they come to know the Lord and I am in the room or I have been able to lead them to the Lord or I heard they accepted the Lord, I will walk them through this. I will go over to them and you'll see them. If somebody comes to know the Lord and they don't have a framework for it. They don't have a language grid to how to express that yet. It's all so new and they're sometimes feeling a little 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 unsettled or just not confident in it and so i'll go to them and i'll i'll uh, i'll talk to them about it and i'll i'll get them to share it with me well what what happened you know and they'll they'll share that i i asked jesus into my heart and i'll say well that's wonderful that's so exciting and then maybe i'll see one of their friends walk by at that moment or sitting in a chair close to us and i'll say you know hey you know you know, Julie is a really, I know Julie's a really good friend of you, yours, and she loves the Lord, you know. You know what? She would be absolutely delighted. It would make her day if you would just share with her now what you said to me. Would that be okay? And, and of course, they'll say yes. I said, well, come on. So we walk over a few feet to where Julie's sitting, and I said, hey, Julie, 
your friend here has some awesome news she wants to share with you. Go ahead. And so then she shares within her own language that she just asked Jesus into her life. And Julie affirms her in that. And you can see her shoulders kind of come up and the confidence begin to happen. What's going on? She is speaking and declaring her faith in the Lord. And as she does, it strengthens within her own spirit and in her own soul. And so then maybe Julie takes her or I take her to someone else and they share it again. And you can see they're, in, they're, they're now feeling more comfortable. They're now feeling more confident. The reality of the Lord Jesus Christ is becoming more and more profound in them. And so maybe they tell their husband or they, they tell their son or they tell someone else, what's going on? It is believing in our heart and sharing that and saying that, declaring it, right? We know that. That's so true. Well, maybe you don't know that, but now you do. <laughs> Isn't that right? So there's power of life in your words. And that's what we're talking about, declaring those words in faith. Let's look at it a little differently. The power of your words. Power of your words I just shared as it relates to your salvation experience. Well, let's go to Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 18, and in the 20th verse, and in verse 21, shares this. Proverbs 18, 21. Give you a minute. Proverbs 18, 20, 21. So you can look it up. It says this. From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled. With the harvest from his lips, he is satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now that is a very powerful statement. Proverbs, you know, the book of Proverbs uh, mistakenly is thought of as being promises, but it's not really promises. It's uh, what we would call more accurately truisms, uh, not promises. That, that is, Solomon wrote uh, truisms. He said, Solomon wrote, this is the way life works. He was a man of great wisdom, and he said, you know, this is what happens. This is the way life is. These are the principles of what happens in life. You know, this, the, the, the way we act and the reactions to the way we act and all of that. So uh, it's, it's rather interesting. It's a very practical book. And so from that perspective, Solomon is saying, this is what I observed, and this is what happens, right? And he says, from the fruit of a man's stomach, from, a, from fruit of, a, of his mouth, I should say, a man's stomach is filled. And so what does he say? Your words, I have observed, he said, that people, when they speak, that their words affect their soul. I observe that when, when people, the words they speak, it affects their bodies. I, I observe that when a person speaks, the words that they, that they speak affects their mind. And so... So, so we say, when I feel something and then say it, it, it affects my whole life. I can, when, when, I, when I speak something out, I can feel it strengthening within me, either positively or negatively. And I can. I've experienced that in my life. And I'm sure you have too if, you, if you're aware of yourself. You'll, you'll be thinking something and then you say it. You say, you're thinking something negative, even negative about yourself. And then you speak that, you can feel it like a shudder go through you, right? But it's the same on the positive side. If you say something positive about yourself, it's the same way. And so Solomon is reminding us that this is the way life works. It's the way our bodies work. It's the way our minds work. It's the way our spirits work. And so he is saying to us, recognize that reality. And he's, so he's saying, from the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled. Recognize that in declarations... That will satisfy you. That will bring fullness. That will release life to you, right? That's the way it works, even naturally, as Solomon said. But when you add to that, being led more than the power of words in your life, if you add to that, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, you have something profound going on in your life. Declarations were intended to bring life when they're spirit-led. Our words, 
when they are connected with the Holy Spirit are profound. They are powerful. They release power. They release anointing. They can release healing. They can release deliverance. They can release impartation. It is the connecting of my, my belief with the kingdom of God. It is, it, is, it is being led by the Spirit of the Lord. And so declarations, our faith declarations are extremely, extremely, extremely potent. Declarations are actually a form of prayer. They are not something isolated from God, but working in tandem and an expression of God's will into the world in which we live. So they are prayer. In fact, if you go back to the Gospel of Mark again, to chapter 11 again, and the 24th verse again, after Jesus said, Whoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea. Jesus Christ went on to say, and he said in that verse, when you speak, you say, he says it's prayer. In prayer. In prayer. He uses the word prayer. It is a form of prayer is what Jesus is saying. Prayer, you know, so, so prayer is communing with God. Prayer is talking to the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to the Father. It is, it is asking. It includes listening, Right? But it also includes declaring, speaking what you hear him saying and what is on his heart for your world and for your life. Again, we note the example of Jesus Christ when we talk about being led by the Spirit in what we speak in those faith declarations. So, John chapter 12, verse 49. John 12, 49. Now here it says, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. Did you notice that? I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Isn't that interesting? So he noted the power of his words, but he also noted the power of his words were connected to hearing what the Father said and then saying what the Holy Spirit was saying within him to say. That makes sense? That's what Jesus said. And so he always said what God said first. So we're going to find ourselves more and more successful in our ability to declare and speak things of eternal life in the kingdom of God and healing and deliverance and ministry and encouragement as we connect stronger and more accurately with the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 3 is a tremendous example of that. Jesus had gone to the temple many times, right? There are so many accounts of it in the Scripture. Several times, different times when he went to the temple. But you know, there was a guy there who was crippled from birth. And Jesus must have walked by him. He never told him to get up and walk, right? Why? Because he didn't see the Father saying that he should do it. I think the Father in heaven was saying, let's leave that one for Peter and John. It'll encourage their faith. And so Jesus didn't hear those words, so he did not say those words to that cripple. But then later on in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, Peter and John are walking to the temple one day. And the man who was crippled was begging. And what did they do? They said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. Isn't that something? They asked. Isn't it also interesting that in their declaration of faith, they added the power and authority of the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, walk. Walk. In Jesus' name, walk. 
made that statement. I find that very, very profound and interesting. And so I'm just saying that, 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 that we have the ability to speak life into people, bring encouragement, bring healing. Let us never underestimate the fact that there are times in our lives where we just need to declare, where we need to in faith speak these things out in agreement with what the Father said. That's what Peter and that's what John did. That's what Jesus did so many times in the Gospels. Whoever shall say to this mountain, speak with authority to that mountain, right? But I tell you, when you work that in tandem with the name of Jesus and as you're following the Holy Spirit, that becomes even more accurate, right? More profound. Here's, here's three practical tips as we uh, pull this all together. Very practical where the rubber hits the road, so, so to speak. Uh, number one, I would say this. Declare over your own life. How does this work? You can declare things over your own life. You know, there, there are times when it just doesn't feel right. But that's okay. Even when, when there are verses on healing, it can feel, doesn't feel right to declare healing over your life. I get that. But you look for those verses uh, of comfort or hope or about your identity because the Lord talks about our identity, how we are His children and so forth. And that can, when you first read those verses, it may not, you may not feel very much like you have hope or you may not feel like comforted or you may not feel that your identity is right. But as you begin to speak those words, it begins to affect you. It begins to touch you. It begins to release, light, release life to you. So find verses that speak life and healing and hope into your life and whatever area you're dealing with in your own life. Declare over your own life. Find verses that, that touch you in a specific area that you're feeling a need, right? Even if it doesn't feel right, you know what, that's what you need. So look for those verses. Allow them to begin to touch you. Or maybe they're not touching you yet, but they're intriguing. They are intriguing you. Take them and then begin to meditate on those words and thoughts from heaven. To meditate is to ponder, to reflect. Do you know in the Hebrew the word meditate means this, to utter or to moan. It means soft speaking to yourself or muttering. What, what's that all about? That's declaration. That's a form of declaration. You are declaring over your life. So you take a verse, maybe it's on hope. Maybe it's a word on hope. You need a word of hope today. Or maybe it's a word on comfort. So you, so you find his word on comfort or hope, and you begin to speak over that. You begin to mutter it to yourself. You begin to speak it to yourself. What are you doing? You are speaking to your spirit. You are speaking to your soul. You are allowing the Holy Spirit to bring life to you. And you know what's going to happen? It's going to build up in your heart. And you think, peace, instead of anxiety, instead of worry. You know, those thoughts begin to come. Uh, this is just very practical stuff, guys. And as they become alive and they begin to become personal, it, becomes God, it then becomes God's word to you. It becomes what we call rima, R-H-E-M-A. It becomes a rima, a personal word to you. Then you start even more declaring it and speaking it out over your life, right? So practical tip on declarations, it applies to your own life. It applies to you. Declare things over your life. Declare his word over your own life. Uh, number two, tip number two, declare in the world in which you have been sent. Declare in your world. Declaring is so helpful. You know what it says in Joshua chapter 1? And in the third verse, it says, I will give you every place where you set your foot. I will give that to you, God said to Joshua. Isn't that something? Where has God placed you? Well, it's not rocket science, guys. He has placed you. You have a family. You have a place of influence. You have a job or a career. You have people you meet on a regular basis when you go to the grocery store or when you, 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 wherever you're serving, whatever club you're a part of. That's your world, guys. And God has given you authority in the place where, where you are at. 
you have been called there and you have an authority there. You can declare over your wor world. See, I've been called to different places. Uh, one of the areas at this time in my life I've been called to is, is as you know, I've been called to become, to be the chaplain at the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 281, which is Port McNeil. I have been placed as the chaplain for the RCMP here in Port McNeil and in the surrounding areas. Uh, Port McNeil is my home base. So, so I've been placed there, and that's been accepted. That's been recognized. And I am the pastor, the lead pastor, or the community pastor that, that serves in this congregation. So what does that tell you? That's part of my world. And so I have authority in my world. I have a level of authority in the spiritual realm, right, to make declarations where God has established me. Why am I telling you that? It's not all about me. I'm using me. Stan Rukin as an example that you have by a kingdom principle, you have jurisdiction, you have authority and strength in your world, more than you in your physical mind realize to declare. You can be in prayer closet, you can be driving in your car, you can be up on a mountain somewhere, you could be at the riverside doing steelhead fishing, whatever. But as you are, you can be declaring and saying things over the people in your world, and you have an authority to do that. Yes, you do. Expect to hear the Holy Spirit voice. And as you, dear, as you do hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you or a nudge or a sense, begin to say it, right? You can practice down at the river. You can practice down at the ocean. You can practice as you're walking through the bush, right? You know, I'm uneasy. Well, get out in nature somewhere or in your car and, 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 and just begin, and you'll find his life beginning to flow. Third one, last one I'd mention, uh, practical tips. First one was declare over your own life. Second was declare over the world you've been sent to. God placed you. God has placed you. And the third one is you can also declare beyond those things when you are given permission to declare, when you are given permission to pray over someone. Jesus, we find that with the, uh, the story of the boy who had seizures, Matthew 17. Remember I was telling that, verse 20-ish, around there, that whole story, has seizures. What happened? He was asked, he was given permission to pray. Someone came to him, the father came and spoke to Jesus and asked him if he could help him, if he would pray for his son. What happened? He was given authority. He was given permission. And then he spoke over the boy, right? And so the, the, there is that aspect of people asking you to pray. There is that aspect of uh, the people that are in your world. There is that opening that comes as you're interacting and you ask for permission to pray. You know, those kinds of things. What has happened? People are giving you authority to be able to declare. It comes through relationships and all of that kind of thing. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about how you, my dear friend, have the ability to speak life into people. You do. You can speak into the mountains in your world and in your own heart, in your own body, into the lives of the people in your sphere of influence. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. You can do that today. Yes, you can. You are made in the image of God. You are a child of God. You are his hands. You are his feet. You are his face. And you are his mouthpiece. Agree with heaven. Agree with the Holy Spirit in the world in which you are. Your words are powerful. Take your words now and join them with his words. And that becomes the wow factor. Listen for his voice and speak it out in faith. Well, what if I'm not sure I'm hearing his voice? Well, you're aware, right? Go for it. What, what, what can go wrong with saying words of life? I mean, you, I mean, you got to use wisdom when you're talking to people. I get that. But sometimes we get so tied up in knots. The point is you have the ability to hear his voice just to make those declarations. Make declarations of faith, guys.
God will use you in a powerful way in your world. And, he'll use, and the powerful is big and small stuff and all kinds of things in between. Praise the Lord. So that's the word I had for you today. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, that's you. Say unto the mountains in your life, be thou moved. And the Lord says they will be removed from here into the ocean. They'll be totally gone. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand that we can make declarations in faith. We don't have to change our tone of voice. We don't have to try and do it like somebody else. We, just have, we can just be the integrity and the reality of who we are and agree with heaven and say the things that are on our heart that the Spirit gives to us, Lord, and speaking life and healing and encouragement and blessing into people's lives in a very creative ways that touches us in the church but doesn't have to sound churchy or religiousy but very natural in the world in which we live show us how to do it lord to see mountains moved for the glory of jesus christ amen god bless you